month for one to one and a half million German soldiers. So that really is a standout. That's massive saturation. How do we account for that? Nothing else to read on the Eastern Front. For the British and the French, especially, first of all, for the French, the French always had all their national and domestic newspapers available in every town. Okay? French soldier newspapers had to compete with all the local domestic newspapers. You're in France, you're defending in France, local towns are French. British, a lot of domestic papers are sent over. They have access to a lot of other reading material. The Germans on the Western Front, a lot of German newspapers get to them. It's just not that far, okay? And a lot of German soldiers, especially officers, can read French, okay? They have access to all kinds of material. All of this is not true for German soldiers way out on the Eastern Front, okay? They have no local languages, if there was any material to read. It takes two weeks for a letter from home to get to German soldiers on the Eastern Front. Same thing for, local news, for home front newspapers. They needed a lot of reading material, so these newspapers are incredibly important on the Eastern Front. Censorship. We don't know a lot about the British system. It seemed like the least formal system. It was the smallest number of soldier newspapers. So we don't have any formal archival material laying out how British newspapers were, papers were censored. We know officers would have looked at them as British officers read letters from, from soldiers. There's one editorial in the Minden magazine, one of the most popular of the British newspapers. We are not allowed to insert the names of the various places we go to. Neither are we allowed to discuss too minutely the ins and outs of our prolonged misunderstanding and unpleasantness with the Germans. Neither are we permitted to criticize too freely our political enemies or friends. That's about as close as we get to how the framework of censorship worked for the British newspapers. British newspapers. The French, more formal, an apparatus was set up in 1916 with kind of directives to, office, to officers that they had to look over and make sure that these newspapers weren't undermining morale or anything of the sort. But it becomes much more formal after the French mutinies in 1917. After the French army mutinies in 1917, then there are an actual official apparatus set up where a copy of every French soldier newspaper has to go to general headquarters and be looked at before the soldiers, before it's allowed to be printed and seen. The Germans, unsurprisingly, had the most formal network for censorship. It was by far the biggest apparatus of soldier newspapers. From 1916, they have a system similar to what I just said for late in the war for the French. A copy of every newspaper has to go to German headquarters to be looked over. In addition to that, the German, and the war press office is what it was called for Germany, everything had to go through the war press office and be sent out again. And the war press office itself wrote articles itself and sent them to the newspapers, asking the editors to put them in the newspapers. We know from correspondence that the editors hated to do this because they said, write letters, we will lose our audience if we put your propaganda in them. I mean, these stories, if once in a while they would put them in, so I've seen some of these stories. They're stories like Fritz and his buddies are sitting around the campfire, and Fritz says, you know, guys, wouldn't it be really comradely of us if we all put our money together and bought a war loan? <laughs> Ham fisted. I mean, this propaganda was so poorly done that there's a 1937 Nazi dissertation about the German soldier newspapers in the First World War. And the main thesis of it is, there was no propaganda value at all in these newspapers. This was a completely wasted opportunity. And should another war soon arrive, we're going we're gonna to do a much better job with our soldier newspapers. And they do. It's the reason there is no dissertation on the German soldier newspapers of the Second World War. Because there doesn't seem to be much reflection of soldier feeling in them. It's just pure propaganda. Okay. So, formal apparatus for the Germans, those articles being written for them, but the most fundamentally important thing that I need to be able to say, that was crucial for me, be, me to be able to say as to why I think the voice of soldiers was represented in these newspapers is, the Germans had to pay for the newspapers. Very important in the censorship argument. German soldiers paid for their newspapers. The few most popular German soldier newspapers were free they were free because they were full of advertising. 
which also tells you that soldiers were picking up these newspapers because advertisers were paying to put their ads in them because they knew they were so popular. So unlike the British and the French, which were largely distributed freely, the Germans had to pay for these newspapers and they paid for them in vast numbers. Okay? So there's production and distribution, there's censorship. Now, what is in those newspapers? First of all, some general comments to make about the overall <coughs> way in which I characterize these newspapers. It struck me by doing this you know, directly comparative dissertation where I was constantly working. If you're in the Jay Winter School of History, you're always dealing with British, French, and German sources. He does everything in a comparative way. So I'm trained as a comparative historian. And so you see the similarities and differences right away. And the thesis that I came up with is that soldiers, there is a long continuum in terms of how much soldiers talk about justifying what they're doing. And it depends on the context. And the context here is from French soldiers on French soil defending French citizens to Germans on French soil attacking French people. These people, the French, spend no time justifying the war. Spend no time telling themselves they're doing the right thing. These people, the Germans, spend a lot of time telling them that they're fighting a war of defense. Yes, we're everywhere on French soil or Russian soil. None of our soldiers are in, are in Germany, but this is a war of defense. So, you see this across all these newspapers. The French newspapers are, I mean, the major way to distinguish them is incredible honesty. They talk about the war in the most open and honest way that the other newspapers don't at all because they don't have to justify anything. They're on French soil defending France. The British are in this weird, vague world, okay? Yes, they have the luxury of knowing they're on the defensive, but they're defending French people. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard for us 100 years later to think of how absurd it was that British people, Canadians, died in muddy fields for French people. That is so normal for us today. We've been allies now for a very long time. A hundred years ago, there would have been, you know, 40 year, 50 year old editors of British soldier newspapers who all they knew were 500 years of hating and killing French people. And here they are defending French civilians from their classic ally, the Prussians. It's usually the British and the Germans killing Napoleon's armies. That's the normal way of the world. And it flips over within a few years in 1914. So the British have this really vague approach to the war of Yes, we're defensive, but why are we here? They're not invading Britain, but vaguely, yes, Britain will change. If, if Germany defeats France, then our way of life in Britain might change, maybe. So it's this really vague way of justifying the war, which, as they're British, is completely masked and covered through relentless humor. Everything is a joke. There is no facing up to reality in the British newspapers. It's almost a form of self-censorship. Endlessly making a joke out of everything, as opposed to directly facing the situation that they're dying in Flanders fields defending French people. Jokes, jokes, jokes. The Germans, as I already alluded to, it's all about we are proper, good, gentlemanly comrades. We're comrades with each other. We bring culture and civilization to the French and the Poles and we are defending the fatherland. If we aren't here, they're at home. This is language you're all very familiar with from the last decade. I mean, to a US soldier in Baghdad, it's more complicated than being on American soil. You have to, it's more abstract when you defend the homeland on the other side of the world. It's more work for the average soldier. And you see that in these Germans trying to do this language of a war of defense while you're not on your home soil. 
It's more work. And you see that. It's characterized. These are the main character differences over all the three different newspapers. So in terms of humor, the French, as I said, are incredibly honest. I mean, there's depictions. There's a sketch in a French soldier newspaper of a nurse kneeling and washing the amputated leg of a soldier. An image like that absolutely never appears in the British or the German newspapers. Okay? That kind of war is horrific and ugly, but we have to fight it. We're, we're, we're in France. We're really famous, okay? That kind of level of honesty and really honest jokes, the likes of which you do not see in the British or German <coughs> newspapers. Uh, one of the French jokes, the rank stupidity of the army and vastness of the sea are the only two things which can give an idea of infinity. That's not the kind of language you get in the German or the British newspapers. Of course, as I've already said, the British are, these are joke books. The British soldier is, I mean, this is the country of Monty Python. This is not, this is not a huge surprise of the incredible amount of humor in the British newspapers. It is a kind of self-censorship. There is no facing reality in these newspapers. It is relentless jokes about everything. And dealing with life through jokes uh, of course, this is British humor. It's made me sex in the toilet. Okay, those are two main areas. Um, I could spend a long time listening to you some of the best jokes from those, but I'll give you two from both of those categories. First of all, sex. Jack and Bill went up a hill to see a Frenchman's daughter. The censor's here, and so I fear I can't say what they taught her. And the toilet. The latest war news, the Germans have taken Cascara Sagrada on the Dutch frontier. The British admit the Germans have taken Cascara, but doubt their ability to hold it. The enemy is evacuating all along the line, and the strain on their rear is tremendous. The Germans are trying to suppress this, but it is leaking out in several places. What price the scrap of paper now? Big surprise here, not a lot of humor in the German newspapers. <laughs> That's my big reveal. <laughs> but very similar to the French. There are jokes in there, but just much more serious. Okay, There's room for jokes in both those traditions, but as is the stereotype, the British, when you're comparing these two newspapers to the British as I was, of course they're going to lose. Okay, There's just no dealing with the amount of British humor and you so... It makes the French and the German Germans look like really boring old parts. But nevertheless, there's some humor in there, but for the most part, it's the same kind of overall serious approach to the war that doesn't allow for a lot of jokes. The enemy. The single biggest surprise for me of the entire research experience was that the enemy does not exist in any of these social newspapers on all sides. This is a universal experience of all three sets of soldier newspapers. It's incredible. There is no discussion of the enemy other than in once in a while a joke. There's a German sketch of a French soldier sleeping. It's called the Poilu's dream, French soldier's dream, there's the cloud bubble above his head and it's a brand new suit. So the French soldier's dreaming of having some nice clothes. There's a British joke. Um, German soldier yells over, hey, I've got a wife in Birmingham. And this British soldier screams back, keep your head down or there'll be a widow. Just little tiny snippets, that's it. There's no discussion of the enemy, there's no discussion of violence, there's no discussion of no man's land. It's all about their lives behind the line. They clearly are not interested in talking about that element of their daily lives. They don't want to talk about it. They're not buying these newspapers to read about the horror of the war. They're trying to forget the little bit of time they're outside of the trenches. Now, this flies directly in the face of a major argument being made, mainly by some French historians, but, but also some of their colleagues, called the, the war culture thesis. The war culture thesis is the argument that the way we understand four years of relentless fighting in World War I